Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your host. And as you know, if you watch the show, every so often we uh, spend our entire hour talking to some fabulously interesting person in our community. And today uh, is one of those days. Very happy today to have as our guest Jackie Goldberg, longtime community activist, educator, a member of the Los Angeles School Board, presently member of the Los Angeles City Council, and running for the California State Assembly. But that's just the beginning of the news about Jackie. Welcome, Jackie. Well, it's good to be here, Sheila. I'm really glad to get to talk to you. Me too. Um, the reason I think we do this on this show and uh, spend the time sometimes talking to you know an individual instead of doing a show about an issue is that a lot of times our, our lives are about issues and, and kind of illuminate uh, how we get where we are, uh, et cetera. And I, I just love talking to really neat people like you. Um, so just tell me, where, where did this all start? Where were you born? What was your family life like? Well, I grew up in Inglewood, California, a uh, blue collar suburb uh, of Los Angeles uh, that was until, um, I guess, the late 60s or early 70s, pre pretty much all white. Um, and when they mean white, they mean white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Catholics and Jews were not regarded too well either. Mm -hmm. Deed restrictions existed until they were constitutionally struck down for Jews, Asians, and African Americans in Englewood. Mm. But it was the only place that my parents uh, in the 40s could afford to buy a home. So for them it was, they just went and did it. There were bean fields on uh, both sides of the house when I was growing up, so it was uh, in the sticks. We drove into L.A. I remember. I was over by the Coliseum yeah. growing up at the same yeah. time, not too far away. And I have an older brother, and my mother uh, was a school teacher in Los Angeles, elementary school teacher for about 35 or 36 years. My father was not a very successful businessman uh, who owned an industrial laundry and uh, worked really, really hard at it. And um, between the two of them, we were aspiring to the middle class. <laughs> Those were the days when teachers didn't make as much in elementary school as they did as high school teachers. Huh. Um, um, so I grew up in, in a nuclear family in, the, in, in a very reactionary community. Um, but uh, I, you know, it was, it was a safe place to grow up, so that was a positive. Uh, at least mostly safe. Um, it was safe if you were white, not so safe if you weren't. I understand. But what were your folks like? Um, my parents were Adlai Stevenson liberals. Mm -hmm. uh, they were pathological voters, <laughs> uh, but otherwise per not particularly politically involved at all. Um, we idolized Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, we uh, worried about uh, what would happen to people, but uh, I would say that they were liberal, mm -hmm, kind of centrist liberals, pretty good on issues of race because, and ethnicity because the tie-in of, of being a discriminated group, being Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, but on the whole, not, uh, not very politically involved. Well, I think probably the first public picture people have of you, although we captured it a lot later, uh, those of us who went to see the film Berkeley in the '60s, yeah, yeah. thinking about Jackie Goldberg on top of a car or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So there's um, the decision was made to go to college. Clearly, yeah. uh, had your family gone to college? Well, my mother, who is the youngest of eight, was the first in the family to go to college, and she went to UCLA when it was at LA City College campus, right. and then finished at the Westwood campus. My father didn't finish high school. Uh, there was a depression, he could make a little money doing this and that, and, and, and he did. Um, but he cared a lot about education and cared about learning, always regretted not having finished school. And we, it, there was no question in our household about whether we were going to college. There was only a question of which college and how we were going to pay for it, but never a question of whether you were going to college. It was just a foregone conclusion. And my mother was an activist, a real, genuine, bona fide community organizer. But she didn't put it in political terms. She did it around the temple, around City of Hope, around uh, Cedars of Lebanon Hospital. But she was a real activist. Uh, she taught me, I would have to say, 95% of the, what I know about organizing I learned from my mother. 
So you packed up to go to Berkeley. You applied to schools. You got into yeah. Berkeley. Well, actually, I, I went to SC a year. Oh, you did? Yeah, my freshman what year. What a change. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's just to get out of high school. By yeah. the time I got to be a senior, I really couldn't take it. Right. And there was a program there that let me go there a year early. So I didn't have my senior year in high school. I went to SC. SC turned out to be my high school with ashtrays. Um, so I applied to a lot of places. Uh, my dearest friend was at the University of Chicago, and I really wanted to go there, but I didn't get any money. I got in, but I didn't get enough scholarship funds. Mm -hmm. So I went to Berkeley as my second choice. Not that I didn't want to go there, but it was my second choice. And what year was that? That was in 1963. Mm -hmm. uh, six months, two, no, 62. 62, three was my first year there. And uh, well, it was really quite <laughs> overwhelming. Um, it we had already had, um, and I, I let me say I, I had won in high school the American Legion essay contest, and I was Rotary Girl of the Year. I did not see myself uh, as a political leftist at all. Uh, my brother did. He knew from the beginning he was on the left side of the uh, of the aisle. I I saw myself as. Uh, you know, an Adlai Stevenson liberal. I didn't, this apple didn't fall very far from the tree. Uh, but several things happened to me that got me uh, to be involved as a political activist. One of them was at SC, which was, uh, there was on November the 1st, 1961, a one-day strike for peace by a bunch of women nationally. And I moseyed on over there. It was at City Hall in LA. And I met some of the most incredible women on that one day walkout that later started the organization Women Strike for Peace around the country. Uh -huh. Those days, there wasn't a war in Vietnam yet, so at least not one that we knew about. That's right. Actually, there actually there was, was a war there. in Vietnam, but we didn't know about it yet. Right. So we were talking about Strunch in 90 and milk, and we were talking about test ban treaties, and we were talking about nuclear testing in the at Atmosphere. As a high school teacher, I would tell kids, do you know we used to explode nuclear devices, not underground, which would have been bad enough, in the atmosphere? And they just think, what could you have been thinking of <laughs> that you would do that? You know, it's just amazing. But, and at the time, just to question it was treason. Oh, you know? absolutely. Um, so uh, th when I came back from that one day strike piece, I was so excited, and my Orange County roommate locked me out of our dorm room. Because you had gone to because this? Because I was now clearly a communist. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So I thought, well, see, it's an interesting thing when people call you a communist when all you're doing is something you think is a good idea. It makes you wonder what communists are like. Maybe they're really <laughs> wonderful people. No, but no, I mean this seriously. Uh -huh. I grew up very anti-communist, uh, like everybody else in the 50s in America. and and. I just thought, well, well, this is an interesting idea. You mean communists were the people who were there? Well, I love those people. These were strong, dynamic women. I had never met a group of women like that that yeah. I met on those steps. So now I go to Berkeley, and I immediately start with another woman, Campus Women Strike for Peace. Um, and really, we, the next thing was to get involved in the civil rights movement, which, uh, which was really quite exciting at those times, uh, at that time, nationally, it was going on. My first vivid memory of questioning authority came when I watched on television, on black and white TV as a kid, uh, the governor of Alabama, no, Arkansas, standing in front of the schoolhouse keeping uh, black children from coming in. See. This, I, I, I bought all the stuff in my government class. I thought we had done with discrimination. We had laws against it. It was OK. And while I knew I wasn't that naive, I knew that African Americans didn't have an easy time of it, I certainly never believed in my lifetime that I'd watch a governor of a state try to keep black children out of a school simply because they were black. That was a very profound effect on me. And I think, really, as I talk to people, I'm 54, as I talk to people in my age group, Whole bunches of them tell you they can remember where they were sitting, they can remember the going, oh my God, when they saw that, and it had a profound effect on, on their lives. So for I me remember it did. the it, it, in 63, um, I had gone to Birmingham because the cast of Dobie Gillis and a number of other oh. TV shows went down to the Alabama State Fair, and there we were quietly ensconced at the Tutla Dinkwala Hotel. Mm. And, uh, we began to notice that when we walked down the street, any African American walking toward us stepped into awesome. the gutter. Right. And not really understanding right. at all, this was a state law. Right. 
and going home and then later that year watching the fire hoses being turned yeah. on people yeah and had that same sort yeah. of galvanizing you know my injustice button right which exactly gets pressed a lot bam. these days <laughs> bam but you could really remember yeah, it that it goes off it goes yeah, off it yeah. really does so that was very profound so then when in when when i was living in berkeley the my first year i was there uh there was the lucky store shop in which is probably the most bizarre demonstrations <laughs> over a period of months I've ever been involved in. And Lucky's Market had a market right on Telegraph Avenue. Um, and it hired no people of color, virtually none, not one. Um, and uh, I don't know if that was chain wide or just that store, but anyway, we decided we would core and snick and a bunch of us would go picket that one. But I wasn't doing any good. So then we decided, well, we'll take the picket inside. Well, then we started getting busted, so we couldn't take the picket signs inside. So then we decided on a shop-in. And we would go and we would fill our cart with everything we could possibly get and get up and check out and then not be able to find our wallet <laughs> or our money. Uh, and if, you know, 20 people do that, you could empty a pretty good-sized number of shelves that way. Um, <laughs> So we would go and we would do that and then we'd leave and then at night the kids from the sororities and the fraternities would come down and help reshelf all the stuff. Um, and then the next day we'd all come back and you know, and we'd always have a ringer, a person who would actually buy the groceries so they couldn't tell which one of us it was going to be that you know. Um, and we did that for months and months and finally they changed their practice. Well, that was the wrong thing to do with us. Success just really emboldened <laughs> us enormously. We went over to San Francisco and took on Auto Car Row. Uh -huh. uh, and that was in 19, March of 1963. It was the first time I was arrested. Uh, first we did the Sheraton, we did the hotels, then we did the auto car. We did the Sheraton Palace Hotel. What'd you do to get arrested? Uh, we sat, we had a sit-in in the lobby. Uh -huh. Uh, and that was another interesting point in my life because getting arrested is not like anything else that you'll ever do in your life. Now, it's not like today. Today, when people do civil disobedience, they get arrested, they go home. Uh-uh, not in the 60s. In the 60s, you do civil disobedience. They put you in jail. They set very extraordinarily high bail for misdemeanors. They require you to come to court every day for long jury trials. And usually, they convict you and give you long sentences for very little uh, crimes. At the same night that I was arrested in the Sheraton Palace Hotel for sitting in to try to secure the rights of people of color to have jobs in the hotel industry of San Francisco, uh, in another Sheraton in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, a group of, uh, of celebrating fans of University of Illinois football team uh, celebrated a big victory in a Big Ten game and literally destroyed the lobby of the hotel. There were no arrests, there were no convictions, there were no trials. We sat peacefully, picking up the litter after ourselves. We were all arrested. Uh, half of us ended up doing time. The rest of us spent most of the spring semester in court. Uh, and so those kinds of things really had a tremendous impact on but me. But there's a transition here that I'm missing. Um, you're the Adlai Stevenson, mm -hmm. apple didn't fall far from the tree, um, caring about people's rights. There are a lot of people who may have some sympathy, maybe a few less who might have some empathy. Very few are going to go into San Francisco to sit in knowing that you might be arrested, to, you know, do these kinds of demonstrations. I mean, you were caught up in something. Mm -hmm. This is much more than just liberalism. I mean, there's a difference between liberals and caring and what we now call progressives, but I guess in those days they called us radicals, who would do. Tommy Pinkos. I mean, who would do? What is it yeah. that moved you from caring to doing? I mean, well, there's a, there's I a difference Well, I think it really there. was my mother. I mean, my mother was a true activist. She really had no truck for people who sat around and complained and weren't willing to do something about it. She did it in her own context. It might be that people were complaining and griping that the Temple Bazaar was poorly organized and you couldn't find anything to buy even though there were some really good things there to buy. So she would get a committee together and figure out how to organize it so that it would be effective but it was still the notion that 
You don't just sit around and complain about it. I don't want to hear it. I've, I heard, she must have said that a thousand times <laughs> in my life. I don't want to hear it. If you're not going to do anything about it, I don't want to hear it. Well, that's a very powerful message. And then to see someone do it. I mean, she decided that, uh, that Gateways was an important institution in the community. Wasn't very popular. Mental health never is. Uh, but she had a group of women who were blue collar working class. They were not rich people and they raised a ton of money every year uh, for, for gateways because that was something that she needed to do. The, there are people who have those needs and I can't write a check so I'm going to raise the money. Uh, those are powerful messages and I saw it my whole life. I mean my mother was uh, and, to, and when she retired and moved to Marietta Hot Springs okay what's the first thing that, that she did? Uh, in the retirement community, she ends up on the board of directors of the of the association. Then she ends up on the on the committee to deal with whether there's going to be an airport coming to that part of South Riverside, North South Riverside County. Then she ends up on the on the board of a, a major hospital that's going in to talk about community input about so it. So there's this genetic impetus <laughs> to do. I don't know if it's genetic, <laughs> but I do know that the role models you help a lot. Right. And to see her, I mean, she was retired when she was taking on these boards out there. Uh, and, and people always come to my mother and say, well, what should we do about this whenever there's anything they don't like? Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, she's 88 years old. They still come up to her and say, Rose, you know, this thing's not going well. What do we do about this? And she'll think about it, and she'll come up with a plan about what you do about it. So here you are at Berkeley. Yes. Are you are you a lesbian yet? Or oh, you, you know? God, not no. No. <laughs> Although you know, it's it's a wonderful thing when you look back on your life after you're a lesbian. Yeah, hindsight is always you 20, say, twenty. How did I miss all of this? <laughs> How did I not notice that I was in love with my seventh grade gym teacher? How did I miss that? <laughs> I mean, I even knew at the time I was in love with her, but I didn't see that as that. I just thought I really admired her and I cared about her and, and uh, you know, because I was an awkward kid, gawky, overweight, and she was the first person who ever said, well, you probably have some athletic ability that nobody's ever even looked at. And instant love, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I became a jock after that. <laughs> <laughs> but so while you're in college, though, this is no. not. I mean, it was too early for any uh, evidence of sort of the movement yeah. at school. No, anyway. I did live in a sorority with 78 women, um, of whom I'm aware that at least two are lesbians, but I'm sure there were more that I, we haven't all kept up with each other, one of whom was one of my roommates at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but no, no, I was a, a confirmed heterosexual, uh, not doing too well <laughs> socially. I didn't do too well. Um, but uh, no, I didn't, I didn't give it a thought. Now, I had because uh, my brother had written a paper in his high school English paper, I'm sure for shock value, but nonetheless about homosexuality. Hmm. So we had discussed it and so forth. I wasn't disgusted by it, mm -hmm. but I certainly didn't think it had anything to do with me. Um, and um, I think basically I just didn't think it had anything to do with me. So what was your first inkling then? You were in your, what, 20s? Oh yeah. Um, and by then you, you had, well, you see, were a teacher. Is that I the first thing teacher. you did after college? Yeah. I went, I went to Berkeley. Uh, at my senior year was the free speech movement. <laughs> God knows how any of us graduated. And then the Vietnam Day Committee, which was even a bigger deal in some ways. Uh, and then I went to the University of Chicago for two years uh, to get a master's in both history and in education. And I taught my first year there and then came back to uh, uh, Los Angeles. In my first teaching assignment was an older woman who was a lesbian who was very willing to talk to me about it, who told me I was a lesbian. I thought, ho, 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 what does she know? She says, you're a dyke kid, you know. I said, <laughs> but Carol, how would you know that? And she says, I know. <laughs> and I remember that conversation. I wasn't offended. I just thought, you know, that's a kind of a crazy thing for her to say. But I was involved in starting um, uh, the Women's Liberation Union in Los Angeles, which I would say was at least half lesbians. Um, and 
uh, I had a lot of, of friendships with lesbians. I was very close to women. Women were, have been throughout my whole life. Women have been more important than men as friends, although I have men, male friends, but they, the women are, have been my closest comrades and allies throughout my life. Um, and at some point, uh, I was in the um, Bread and Roses Theater, and uh, one of the lesbians uh, began spending more and more time at my house, and one thing led to another, and uh, we got into a relationship. And I, I was shocked that I did that. I really was, because it wasn't how I saw myself. I thought, what does this mean? Who am I? All and scary, the, too. Well, it was very scary, but I was also shocked. I just thought, and then, of course, then you sit and you begin to see your life and you see that you're living in a, entirely with women and all through college. <laughs> <laughs> that, that while you have some, I had two relationships that could have ended up in marriage with men, both good guys, that, uh, but, but they didn't, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, one was mostly, uh, but he didn't want to, and the other was mostly I didn't want to. Um, and you know, but you just miss a lot when you're, you're, we're so programmed to heterosexuality. Well, and don't you think it's a hard, I mean, we're so programmed to duality. Yes. That if you let yourself understand that you are a lesbian. Right. It means a lot. It yeah. means, A, you're not straight. Right. Now, that may or may not be the case. It's right. like you're required. Right. Right. It's kind of like, whose side are you yeah. on? You yeah, know, are really. you this or are you that? Yeah, that's and it's near, only right? recently, <laughs> in the younger generation, yeah. really, Gen X yeah. and Gen Next, yeah. where they're starting to say, don't give me those labels. Yes. You know, I'd like to go yes. like sliding scale. Yes. Um, but exactly. We, but we saw it as, yes. oh my Making God, life I'm one of those and right. it's a bad thing to be, right. or it's certainly going to be a beleaguered thing to right. be. Well, I didn't worry about either of those things. The most important thing that I worried about, well, actually, I worried about whether people were going to accept me that had known me as straight. Right. But that turned out not to be a big issue. That really did. I was lucky. I know a lot of people for whom that was not true. Mm -hmm. Where they That's lost right. friends, they lost family. I didn't lose either family or friends. I, God. I was very lucky. Who was the first person you came out to? Uh, who was the first person I came out to? Ah, uh, gee, I don't remember. We were in a very collective kind of living arrangement uh -huh. in Echo Park, Silver Lake. We had a food conspiracy. <laughs> we had eating groups. We had uh, study groups. It was a wonderful community. It still is, but it's not quite the same like that. And I'm sure it was some group of people in there. Probably it was people in Bread and Roses Theater, uh, because uh, the woman that I was uh, had my first relationship with, uh, which lasted six years, uh, and she and I were both in this in the Bread and Roses chapter, which is the the Gorilla Theater group. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think everybody in the theater knew instantly that we were. <laughs> having a relationship, <laughs> though neither of us had told anybody, but I think everybody knew this, the day it happened. <laughs> I kept wondering how everybody always knows these things. I know, yeah. but you can tell with other people. I know. Did, did I write this on my forehead? <laughs> exactly. What here? Well, I think that people probably know you best, at least it, it, certainly in California, uh, in terms of your elected positions, and I think that people assume for people who are elected, that they kind of followed a path, that they're political science majors, or they were you know, class presidents, or they were on a student council or something. And that actually is not the case with an awful lot of people right. who are in elected office. But there is a, there's a transition, or maybe a moment when you see the connection between what you've been doing and this um, way of doing, or doing public policy. Did, did you have trouble deciding to run for your first office? Oh, God, office? yes. It was a school board, right? Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, first of all, I, I kind of poo-pooed electoral politics. Uh, I just said that, you know, not for me, not ever, not now. I, and I love teaching. I mean, for me, the, the big difficulty was I would have to give up something I truly loved. 
do really well. I mean, I don't brag about myself much, but I was a wonderful teacher. That's because I loved it so much. It was, you know, when things you love, often you're good at. And I had such a great relationship with the kids, and we had such a fabulous time just going at government and economics and Africa and Latin America and all the different things that I taught in the high schools. I just had a wonderful time doing it. I was quite content. I really was not looking for something else to do. But uh, school desegregation was going to come as a lawsuit in a case in Los Angeles. And we had just watched with great horror, my friends and I, the whole uh, bus burning, bottle brick throwing in Boston. This is not the South, folks. Mm -hmm. This is the North, this is Massachusetts, for God's sakes, liberal Massachusetts. And they were just racist to the bone, and I didn't have any illusions about what it was going to be like in Los Angeles. And I was determined that um, at least there would be white folks, not just white folks, but for sure some white folks who would be early on organizing a voice that says this is not a bad thing. This is not the end of the, our way of life. We don't have to fight it like it's poison. Uh, it could be good for kids. It could be good for communities. It could be good for our society. Uh, let's see if we can come up with a plan and a program that makes it more comfortable and less frightening to everyone involved. And so I and a bunch of other people started a group called the Integration Project. It was out of that that we began to look at electoral politics because the school board had been completely captured um, by bus stop. Bobby Fiedler, Roberta Weintraub, who eventually became a friend of mine, not Fiedler, but Weintraub. Bus stop being the organization that, that was, was uh, against busing. Against, against, and, and against school integration. Right. It, people say it's against busing, but frankly, they would be against it if we were dropping them in by helicopter, <laughs> if we were driving them there. They were just well, against it. Well, I think that it. became the word that we used yes. for integration. Right. But that's right. right. But right. It's, a, it's a neutral word, see? Yeah. Being against the bus, what's wrong with that? Right, shouldn't be transporting yes. so those we, kids. Yes, so we call them segregationists, which is what they were, and that's why we use the name integration in mm -hmm. our name. Mm -hmm. um, it was through that that we looked at the fact that we needed to have some effect on that school board, and there was a school board seat coming up um, where I lived, hmm. and the seat was held by an appointee who filled the seat of Kathleen Brown when she got married to the guy from, uh, I guess his name was Rice, who was from NBC Sports, and they moved mm -hmm. to New York mm -hmm. right after she got elected. Um, and so we began thinking we would find a candidate and support that candidate and help them get elected. And we interviewed a lot of people. <laughs> we interviewed probably 40 people who were looking at that seat. And there were a lot of good people. I remember one, in per, one woman in particular who I think was really sincere. But you know, to beat an incumbent, even an appointed one, is not an easy task. And it was going to take someone who was going to throw themselves into it with enormous passion. And this woman whose views we appreciated was too white glove. She was not going to do that. Didn't have the fire in the belly. She wasn't going to do that. I, I she totally did end understand. up. She did end up running, and she did lose. She came in third. I mean, mm -hmm. I came in first in the primary. The incumbent came in second, and she was a distant third. Mm -hmm. And she was the heir apparent. Everybody knew her. Everybody loved her. I liked her. I mean, it wasn't that wasn't really the problem. And she had pretty good politics, but she was just not going to do what it was going to take. Mm -hmm. um, so there were two of us who were. We, who were considering it. A uh, wonderful guy who's uh, now a, an executive in the uh, College Guild, Marty Hittleman and myself. And um, they sent us out to dinner. The two of you? Yeah, and they uh -huh. said, one of you come back as the candidate. <laughs> as <a> candidate. <laughs> <laughs> so we each wrote down the things that we thought we could get attacked on at this dinner and the things that we thought that uh, we could get as pluses and who might actually endorse a total unknown that was not involved and who was in favor of school integration, the least popular sentiment in the entire city uh, at the time. 
we used to kid ourselves and say we were the last 35 people that were willing to say they were in favor <laughs> of school integration. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I won by virtue of the fact that I knew Diane Watts and I thought she might endorse me, which uh -huh. she did. Uh -huh. And that I knew Howard Berman and I thought he might endorse me, which he did, mm -hmm. which gave me a little oots of credibility and I became the candidate. This was no burning desire to be the candidate. But once we did it, of course, we got into it with great fervor and nobody believed that I would come in first in the primary. In fact, I got 43%. I nearly knocked out. There were eight people in the, in the, uh, mm. in the uh, primary, so I got 43% with eight people, uh, but so you this shocked saw, everyone. But you saw a connection between, I mean, I understand. Yeah. It, it's an interesting thing when you tell your life story, and many people are like this. Um, it, it almost makes it sound like an accident, though we understand that you chose to do these things. Yes. But it is no accident. There's a, there's a through line that you have to connect for yourself. And maybe it's only in retrospect, as we were saying. You know, hindsight is always 20-20. Yeah, yeah. But the, the line from activism and mm -hmm. what it's for, right. you know, to accomplish a goal, which may right. be school integration, it may be social justice in a larger context, and public policy through elected office. Right. My sense of it, when I made the decision to run, was that you can't abandon that very powerful no, place you you to can't. people who aren't like us. That's right, you can't. I mean, it, whether Absolutely it's about not. being queer, or whether it's about being progressive, Absolutely. or whether, whatever it is, having Women, a social agenda. Color. Exactly. And But there, there's a moment when you have to say to yourself, I, I can do this, or this is a good place for a person to do this kind of work from. Right. Um, you had to have made that decision at some well, point. Well, I think we decided that certainly the, the school board was a place where people who felt as we did about what had to happen in terms of the inequities. We lost the school desegregation case completely. Okay. We got completely cleaned out. Then there was that ballot proposition by Alan Robbins, and that took care of it. It was illegal now to desegregate the schools. Um, so we lost, we got creamed, but out of that we learned a tremendous amount about the inequities in the school system. That some neighborhoods had overcrowded schools and others had miles of playground. That some schools had uh, enough books and supplies and others didn't. That some schools were on half-day sessions and others never heard of the expression half-day sessions. That some schools got all of the brand new teachers and others had seasoned veteran teachers. I mean, so we found out a lot about the school district in, in the process of being in the integration project. Right. That, of course, from the point of view of all of us being activists meant we had to do something about it. And to do something about it, we had to get somebody on the Board of Education. Uh, and it was clear to us at some point that you can't stay outside the system uh, and change some things. Some things you can do from outside. But some things you've got to be at the table. Uh, and that was really clear. And that's, that, that was a major change in perspective. That was a major change in perspective. Well, you know, Antonio uh, Villaragosa, who's the speaker of the California State Assembly, and my assemblyman, your assemblyman, who's termed out and for whose seat you've announced uh, and will be running, um, talks about, and, and he was a community yeah, activist, absolutely, a union totally, organizer, totally. Um, president of the ACLU board, but he, as he speaks everywhere around the state, he talks about how we really can't exist except for the, the authenticity of community organizing, oh, the absolutely. identification of the issues absolutely. You know, by community. It's not like we're dumb and we don't understand it, but there's a certain understanding that people have in their own lives. And it's progressives who listen yeah. to that, really, right. you know, and right. try to convert that into public policy. Yeah. Um, did it work? Some of it did and some of it didn't. I mean, there's, there are restrictions. I mean, one of the reasons I'm actually willing to look at Sacramento, which is not something that I really wanted to do, as you personally well know, <laughs> I know. I think is because so much of what my passion is about, which is education, is decided in Sacramento. Right. Now, I can't sit in L.A and say, woe is me, those dumb clucks in Sacramento don't get it about education. My mother, I can hear her in the back of my ear, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> if there's something wrong, go fix it. So, you know, I, I don't have a, a, 
it's so much ego that I think I can fix it, but I do know some things about that area, and it is true that that's the policy area that makes a lot of difference as to what schools can and can't do and think and don't think about public education. Were you education. glad that you had, were on the school board? Was it I was glad about being on the school board about uh, half of the time. I never loved the job. I never did. There's no staff. No, no elected official should never, ever, ever be without staff because then you're totally at the mercy of the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And we were totally at the mercy of the bureaucracy. Before I left, I was able to go from having an administrative assistant secretary scheduler in one person to having one field representative. But I represented, oh, I would say a half a million people, more than an assembly seat. They're larger than assembly right. seats. And we're not talking about their garbage, we're talking about their children and had no staff, you know. Mm. So that's really terrible. It's a, the LA Board of Education is the worst job a politician can have. Uh, you don't get paid, it's $24,000 a year. When I started it was 12, less than a teacher in Compton. Now mm -hmm. that tells you, we always thought there's nothing lower than a teacher in Compton. The school board was less than a teacher in Compton, no staff mm. and it's a semi-competitive indoor sport uh, to bash the public schools in general and LA Unified in specific. So it's a terrible job. Uh, in spite of all of that, I think we did some things that were important. Were you out? No. Uh, it, uh, yes and no. I, w I w did nothing to get anyone to think that I wasn't lesbian. I went to all of the gay events. I appeared in all the gay parades. Any event that the school board did that required a partner, I went with Sharon, my spouse, of 20 years this October. Um, I, uh, you know, we, we, we put on when it said name of parents on my son's, uh, our son's uh, school cards, uh, we'd scratch out father and we'd put both of our names. I mean, we did nothing to hide it. But we made a deal with our son, I guess he was about nine or 10 years old, and he said, I don't want you to, to pretend you're not who you are. He didn't put it quite this sophisticated. Lie. But didn't want you to lie. I don't want you to lie, but I don't want you to just go around telling people you're lesbians. And particularly, when you come to parent conferences, I don't want you to argue. <laughs> and, I, and I thought that was the funniest thing. Why don't you want you to Because you argue like a married couple. <laughs> <laughs> so smart. Yeah, really. Ryan's smart. Yeah, we know he that. Is. He's a, he's, so I said, okay, that's a deal. And, and he said, when I'm out of high school, you can do whatever you want. And we had rules. The rules were, our house, we weren't going to change anything. We have one bed in our bedroom. We're not going to pretend to anybody that we got different rooms or different addresses. If you don't want to bring your friends here, don't. But if you do, we're going to be a family like we are a family. And he called both of us mom, you know, and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, so we lived our lives. And I think uh, most people who had anything to do with us knew that I was a lesbian. But those were the days when the press didn't ask. And they didn't ask, they thought as a favor to you. Because right. I told him if anyone asked me directly on, I would not deny it. Uh, but until he says, mom, I'm a captive. I, I, you know, I, I can't move to another city or another school. Everybody knows who you are anyway because you're on the school board. He says, when I'm out of high school, do whatever you want. And actually, it was uh, about six months before he was out of high school that I was outed. Did uh, he get a hard time at school? Though? Actually, no, because nobody, it was in the LA Times and none of the kids read the papers. <laughs> If it had been on television, <laughs> it would have been a big deal, but it wasn't on television. Uh, and we were all worried because it was his first varsity game at Marshall High School was the day that the story broke. And I thought, oh, somebody's going to razz him. He's going to get a technical foul for hitting somebody. He said, Mom, I we were at the game. He came home. I said, well, well. He says, nobody knows. They don't read the newspapers. <laughs> so when did you make the transition to the city council and was that a hard thing too? Mike Wu decided to run for mayor which meant that the council seat was open and I will tell you I really did not want to do that. Uh, but what happened was is that first of all almost no women signed up and so actually it was women on the west side of Los Angeles who called me up and said I didn't think I was in the district. 
because it had been redistricted, and I thought I was out of the district, so I wasn't even looking at it. And they called up and they said, oh, we really, we really want you to run there. Hardly any women on the council. We need a woman on the council. All of us will support you. And um, I said, well, okay. And I got a lot of flack from the gay and lesbian community because they wanted me to run out. And mm. it was six months before Brian graduated high school. And I went to the various meetings. I remember one really ferocious one in someone's home. And people attacked me. Uh, because I wasn't going to be out, and I told them the rule that if anybody asked me, I would say I was a lesbian, and I was not going to hide my life. But uh, I was really upset about that. I, these were the people who attacked me, none of whom had children, and I kept saying to them, "You don't understand. He, he, and I, and Sharon, we're a family. He has some rights. He doesn't have a right to tell me not to be who I am. He doesn't have the right to tell me to lie." But we made a compact with this young adult when he was a child, and I feel responsible to keep my end of the bargain. He's kept his. Uh, this boy, I just got savagely attacked by some people that I considered friends. I mean, it was a really disheartening moment for me. I said, as soon as he's finished from high school, we're out. No, no, you got to run out. You got to run out. Well, it turns out I did because uh, somebody from Stonewall <laughs> told the press. They said, oh, the press interviewed him and said, well, how do you feel about having two gay members of the community running for the city council seat? And he said, not two, three. Mm. And I said, who was the third? And he says, well, there's this one, there's this one, and there's Jackie Goldberg. Mm. The press called me immediately. Well, the deal was if they asked. Right. So I said, yes, of course I'm a lesbian. Mm. You know, um, you have such enormous respect in the city, and um, I, I've always thought that it's, at least in part, because you have a very clear through line about your values, uh, your commitment to, you know, there's lots of soft words now, but diversity, inclusion, uh, empowerment, maybe they're not soft words, but um, it's, I, I, my experience is that even people who don't agree with you on some issues will value the fact that at least you tell them what you think, et cetera. Uh, it's, but progressives in politics are still sort of rare. That is, who win. But you've won, you've always won. I mean, you have constantly won. Um, I live in the right district. Well, yes and no. I mean, I don't think there's any right district for a former communist or whatever people think socialist. or thought you were when you I first actually never ran. Was a you know, but no. I was a socialist. I no, still I am a socialist. Were. I know you weren't, but this is from your, you know, mm -hmm. from your mm -hmm. what you said to begin with. How how do you connect with the people in your district? I mean, they're mostly not gay or lesbian. Oh, that's for sure. They're mostly probably not even progressive. Oh, the voters are are. Uh, in some, we have a few. We have a few progressive pockets, but mostly they're conservative to middle of the road. They would probably describe themselves as moderates. A lot of Republicans, um, more Democrats by a lot, but a lot of Republicans amongst the voters. Um, and the voters are much more Anglo than the residential population, which is primarily Latino mm -hmm. um, and Latina. Um, I would say that what you said earlier was, is pretty much it, and it's, it, it is again what I learned from my mother, you know. My mother always told people to their face what she might have said behind their backs. And a lot of people would get really kind of for the moment a little flustered by it. Uh, but then they would say, well, at least you told me to my face, and they would like that a lot better than finding out that Rose said X behind their backs and a different thing to their face. I think people really appreciate honesty. That's number one. And, I, you know, I, I tell my constituents where I am. You know, a lot of my constituents don't support the living wage. Uh, they didn't. Uh, but I explained it to them. I told them why it was important to me. Uh, and I won a lot of people over, and some I didn't win over. But even the people I didn't win over, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce, I have a very close relationship with the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. They came out against it. Um, first of all, they expected that I was going to punish them for it. Hmm. And when I didn't, they couldn't believe it. <laughs> they thought I would never appear at their events, that I would never return their phone calls, that I would never be involved in, in the issues that they were in. I said, no. I'm not going to do that. I said, I'm very annoyed 
that we didn't have more time to talk about it before you took your position. But it, and if that was the only annoyance I had was that they did it really essential without talking to me. And I'm sure they're used to being punished mm. because they don't take the side of the elected official. There's a lot of that in our business, you know, which I don't I approve of. They're still our constituents, whether we agree or not. They're still our constituents. The second thing that I think makes a big difference to people, and it makes a huge difference, is, is that you deliver on the things that are important to them. Now, that's really important. And for city council, that's probably the most important thing. Uh, folks in Atwater who voted overwhelmingly for my opponent, I mean, I'm telling you, if I got 20% of the vote in Atwater, are my closest allies today. Because there were eight or nine things they wanted to do. In the course of six years, we've accomplished six of them. Not eight or nine of them, but six of them. We ground it out, we worked it out, we figured out a way, we stayed with them, we went with them to the hearings or whatever it was, and we did it, and we deliver. We deliver. My uh, predecessor had sent people to all of their meetings. I don't do that. I tell them, you're a community organization, you get two meetings a year from my staff, you tell them when you want them to be there. Because you know what, you really want X project done, and if my staff member is just sitting in on your general business meeting, when is he or she going to get the work done that you want done? It was a terrible blow to them that I wasn't going to have someone sitting in every one of their meetings every month. That's a terrible waste of time. In the amount of time they were doing that, they could have researched four or five different solutions to problem X. So we deliver. We really deliver. People really like that. <laughs> They really like that. And we don't take sides. That's the other thing that's helped me the most in Hollywood. There's all these deals and everybody's conniving and all these. You know, I tell everybody everything. Everybody gets the same information. They get it on the same day at the same time. I don't pick favorites and only help their projects and then ignore everybody else. And I learned all that from my mother. I mean it, I swear to God. I, I tell her all the time, she can't believe that I say this to her because she never put it in a political context and right. she doesn't know it all translates. You know, she, I, I tell her all the time how everything that I've been able to accomplish has come from watching her with people. She likes people. It's not phony. If she's mad at somebody, she tells them she's mad at them and then she gets over it. She doesn't carry it like a little, you know, some people carry anger like a little nut that they keep like a squirrel with a nut. They bury it, they're gonna hold on to it forever here. She says, no, you can tell them you're angry. And then you get over it, you gotta move on. But you know, there's, it's funny, when you're talking about this holding on to yeah, anger, I was thinking as you were talking about here. being the only lesbian somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when I was first elected, I was the only yes. gay or lesbian person up there. Yeah. And you're the only one um, on the council. Right. And you were the only one on the school board. Right. And that's intimate work. I mean, right. despite the fact that you may be surrounded by a community, right. that work with your colleagues on the board, right. my work in the assembly, that's intimate work. Right. That's the number of you, whatever it is. Right. The five or the 10 or the 80. And you're, whether you're, you know, the gay person to them every minute, you're the gay person. Oh, yes. I mean, of all things in the world that you are, you're the lesbian on the floor. Absolutely. The lesbian in the council. Absolutely. Um, and sometimes that feels okay because they are dealing with you in a way that's educational for them and they're mm. some mostly good people thinking, well, this is how I felt about race and this is how I felt about Jews mm. and, you know, I'm learning here. But I find sometimes it's kind of a burden that I carry on my own because it's a, my through line is very much like yours, I think. It's about social justice. And whether I was the Catholic girl or the feminist or the dyke or you know whatever the heck I'm gonna be identified as next, that's the through line. Mm -hmm. And yet, it, you're always the lesbian. Mm -hmm. Has that affected the way your colleagues work with you, the way your constituents see you? I don't know how you I do think work. it, you know, I was telling someone the other day, I think that my constituents have selective amnesia. <laughs> the ones for whom, the ones who really, really like me, but who are homophobic to the core, forget that I'm a lesbian. <laughs> they, I swear to God, I would have to come out weekly in some of the neighborhoods in my district <laughs> for them to remember that I was a lesbian. <laughs> I mean that. 
Um, I, I'll to give you a good example. I registered the county of Los Angeles just had this uh, domestic partner registry. So my partner and I were, went down the very first day it opened and we registered. We got a lot of publicity. I had several people who I, I've worked with for I can't tell you how many years who said, that was lovely. I didn't know you were a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> How did you miss this? <laughs> but you know, it's uh, it's it's you know. So I think there's selective amnesia for people for whom I like you, I respect you, and lesbian don't mix. They ignore the lesbian part of it. I mean, I don't pretend I'm not a lesbian, but right. they ignore it. That's one set of people. Another set of people, um, my colleagues in particular, I think uh, if they were to describe me, I don't think but one or two of them would probably use lesbian. Um, I think when they get annoyed at me, they're much more annoyed at me for like pushing on something too hard that they think I should back off a little or being too strident about something. I, think, I don't think that being a lesbian is the issue. I think your situation is harder than mine. Uh, first of all, 80 is, is, people can be more anonymous in 80 than they can in 15, believe me. Mm -hmm. uh, you, there's nothing that we don't know about each other. <laughs> Although I hope you'll find out. Yeah. It's actually not the case. No. I can tell you right now whose spouse is in the hospital, oh, whose really? child is dropping out of school, and I mean on both sides of the aisle. Really? It's a very intimate oh, okay. job. Maybe it's because you're all sort of. stuck up there together. Yes, exactly. We yeah. don't even live there. Oh, God, that's like we're true. going away that's to college. True. That's and, you true. Know, that's that's true. Uh, I didn't think about that. But with 15, you do too. Yeah. With 15, you do too. And, and very quickly, um, unless your personalities, and there are some personalities that just don't go well together in the, uh, on the council that's, as it's currently composed, unless that's the case, it really hasn't been a big deal. I mean, there have been some funny things. One of my colleagues uh, told a rabbi, uh, one of my Jewish colleagues told a rabbi, and the rabbi was talking to him about the politics of the city and said, this is right after I came on, and said, gee, it's so odd, you know, the city of Los Angeles has a large Jewish population, but nothing that would lead one to believe that uh, seven out of 15 members on the council would be Jewish. And this person, this council member said, no, six. And he went through the list, and he had left my name out. And the rabbi said, but you left out Goldberg. And he says, oh, she's not Jewish. She's a lesbian. <laughs> uh -huh. The rabbi told me the story. Uh -huh. Oh, really? I thought, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. I guess you can't be both. Well, I always thought you could be both. <laughs> yeah, which are you? Which are you? Oh, wait, right. Well, with only a few minutes remaining, let me ask you one last question. Of course. Whatever it is, having okay. millennium fever as I do, do you feel optimistic about the future for... I don't know, for the country, for the city, for yourself? I have a much uh, greater optimism long term than short term. Um, I think the kids, for example, today, they're, they're so into the environment. So that my fears earlier on in my lifetime that this planet would die, be killed, not die, be murdered, mostly by Western nations, but now, increasingly, as I was in China recently, the pollution there is just as bad as anything you can imagine by everybody who wants, and we all want the same things, electricity and plumbing and all of this, and mm -hmm. automobiles and so forth. Uh, so I, I have much greater hope for the future on environmental issues uh, around that. I think that as to the isms, racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, and so forth. I think things have definitely improved in my lifetime, in spite of the fact that they are never as good as we think that it ought to be by the 1999, but they've definitely improved. They have definitely improved, at least in cities like Los Angeles, where you will hear people say racist things, but they're embarrassed after they've said it. Well, they weren't embarrassed when I was growing up, believe me, in this city. Uh, and they're saying it less often, and their attitudes are changing. I saw it when I went back to teaching, uh, 91 to 93. I, the, those kids were significantly different than the kids I had been teaching uh, eight years earlier uh, in their attitudes towards each other. They're caring about each other, uh, in spite of the fact that there was still a lot of racism and homophobia to be had. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I'm not optimistic in one area, 
And that is, is that as wealth gets consolidated into fewer and fewer hands, as that wealth becomes more powerful than nations. See, I think that's what GATT and NAFTA was about, mm -hmm. was making the ruling class, and I don't use that language very often, mm -hmm. but there is a real international ruling class, and that ruling class became more powerful than nations. Just ask Canada, who recently lost a suit on an environmental issue to an American firm mm -hmm. and had to pay damages to the American firm because it wouldn't let that firm violate Canada's environmental laws. I mean, that's the horror of that is I still can't believe that they lost that suit. So on, on the near term, with this tremendous consolidation of wealth, and it is enormous, and in every time you turn around, buyouts, mergers, buyouts, mergers, big fish eating little fish, bigger fish eating littler fish. In the short term, I get very nervous because at some point this is going to come apart. You know, everybody's thrilled about 11,000 uh, 11, on the stock market. It ain't going to last. Right. It's going to come apart because eventually the world is not going to be able to buy back what it's producing. And then what? And I, that's my short, if we get through the cataclysm of what all of this means on this worldwide gluttonous, I can get rich, gap widening, rich versus poor, if we get through that, and it won't be in my lifetime, but if we get through that, then I have just enormous optimism because all the other indices in what I see happening, not just in this country, but in the world, are really positive. But, oh, I'm afraid in the near term. <laughs> a lot of work to do. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're the there, and term. I'm very glad you were here today, Thank Jackie. You. Thank Thanks you. so much for wonderful. joining us. I'd love to do this to you. All right. You Let can do interview. it to me. Get your own show. That's oh, what I okay. say. <laughs> and thank you for joining us, too. And I guess uh, as you look around at your elected officials, uh, people like Jackie Goldberg, you're just going to have to get used to it.